Hello! In this talk entitled Pipeline Overview, we want to give you a different perspective of what has been covered so far in the course while refreshing and summarizing some key concepts. To do this, I will use this generic blueprint, which, as you can see, is a very simple series of steps that can be used for any study that involves data acquisition and analysis, not necessarily neuroimaging or MRI. The reason why we do this is because in courses like this, it is very easy to focus on details, on the different options of the tools, and not necessarily remembering or thinking about why we are using a tool and at which stage of the analysis pipeline we are. So I will go through these steps and recap what we have covered so far, so hopefully it will give you a clearer overall picture that you can refer back to at any time. Let's start from data acquisition. The aim of data acquisition is to obtain good quality data, consistent data, and to optimize signal to noise ratio. When we acquire our data, we need to keep in mind that we need to make some trade-offs, for example, between resolution and acquisition time. We talked a lot about the presence of dropouts and distortions and the need to think about what are the most important regions for our study so that we can optimize the protocol and minimizing artifacts there. So a general advice is not to simply copy the protocol from somebody else's study just because it worked well for them. It might be not the best protocol for our study. Rather, ask yourself, what do I need for my study? And with the same machine, you might be able to get better data for your aim. Data preprocessing steps are all the steps that reduce noise in the data in many ways. Could be doing motion correction, brain extraction, temporal filtering. We do preprocessing to prepare our data for further analysis and ultimately for group comparisons. So in this sense, registration is a preprocessing step too. We need to keep in mind that all these steps require careful checking by looking at the reports from the tools and at the data itself. We may need to add additional steps depending on the MRI modality and on the type and amount of noise. And we will talk about some of these steps in a specific video. Single subject analysis is the step that gives us a measure of interest per subject. And it will be different depending on the modality we are using. In our case, most of the time, the output is an image of that single subject measure, for example, a gray matter map or a single subject activation map. Once we extracted our single subject measures, we can run a group level analysis to compare these measures across subjects. We may want to derive a group map, compare groups, or study the correlation with another variable of interest. Things to keep in mind are the fact that we can have additional layers between single subject and group analysis. For example, we may want to average results from different sessions for each subject before running the group level analysis. At this stage, we can also account for confounding variables like age, disease duration, or other variables we may want to control for. Finally, we do our statistical inference. This is the step that gives us our p-values, or in our case, in case of images, our p-corrected maps. At this stage, we are testing whether our results are reliable and whether they are generalizable to the population. We need to keep in mind that we need enough subjects to have enough power and that we cannot interpret null results. So if our results are not significant, it means that we cannot reject the null hypothesis, but we have not proved it. So we can say that the brain measure is not statistically different between two groups, but we have not proven that it's the same. Here is what we have covered so far in the course. We started with registration, then structural analysis. We talked about the fMRI pre-processing, single subject fMRI analysis, and then group level statistics and inference in the last session. What I'm going to do now is to regroup all these topics according to the generic blueprint and summarize some key concepts. Here are all the pre-processing steps. As we said before, 
all these aim to reduce noise and or prepare the data for further analysis. In structural MRI, the main pre-processing steps are brain extraction, which removes non-brain tissue and helps registration and segmentation. For structural analysis, brain extraction needs to be very, very precise. Bias field correction to correct for B1 inhomogeneities, so in those related to the RF field, and registration to put images in the same space for group level analysis. For fMRI, the list is longer because fMRI is intrinsically noisier. We will still need to do brain extraction to help with registration. We do motion correction to get consistent anatomical coordinates over time. We need to keep into account the fact that different slices are acquired at different times. So there is the option to do slice timing, but as you remember, we instead recommend to use temporal derivatives in your GLM. Spatial smoothing is used to improve signal to noise ratio and to validate the assumptions of statistical tests. Temporal filtering used to remove slow drifts. And finally, registration, this time including unwarping to correct for B0 inhomogeneities and register the images into the same space. The next step is single subject analysis. In structural MRI, we looked at segmentation of brain tissues, subcortical structures and lesions, and we looked at how to run voxel-based morphometry and a vertex analysis. Actually, VBM and vertex analysis are a mix of single subject and group level analysis. They are in between the two steps. The reason why we put them here is because we cannot go straight from, for example, the gray matter maps to group level analysis. We need some additional steps like modulation and smoothing. And so they are not images that are ready yet for group level comparisons. While we in fMRI, we defined our single subject design matrix and contrasts and run our first level GLM. Things to remember for structural analysis, for segmentation that the main tools are FAST for tissue type segmentation, FIRST for subcortical structures and Bianca for white matter hyperintensities. For VBM, uh, that it is used to detect differences in local gray matter volume and that we need to modulate our gray matter maps and apply spatial smoothing. For vertex analysis, we run first utils on the output of first to look at the shape differences in subcortical structures. For fMRI single subject, we need to build our design matrix where we have one entry per time point and where our explanatory variable or regressors are the model of the predicted response based on the stimuli presented at each time point. For example, we can, have, uh, we can model one EV per condition of our task. We then use the GLM to calculate the parameter estimates for each EV so that the linear combination of these EVs best fits the data. And finally, we do some maths on the parameter estimates. So we set up T contrasts and F contrasts to ask a research question. The output is a contrast of parameter estimates or COPE image that we will use later for group comparisons. The group level analysis step is common to structural and functional analysis. And we will see that in fact is common to other modalities because the only difference is the input. We have our group level design matrix that this time has one entry per subject instead of one entry per time point. Our EVs now describe the group composition or the variable that we want to use in our correlation analysis. And we can also include confounds like age or sex uh, that we want to control for. We then fit our GLM with the only difference across modalities being the input. For structural analysis, if we do a VBM, the inputs are the smoothed, modulated gray matter vol volumes. While if we do vertex analysis, the input are the single subject subcortical meshes. For fMRI, the inputs are the first level contrast of parameter estimates with the associated variance, so COP and VARCOP images. Also in this case, we do maths on the group level parameter estimates 
So we set group level T and F contrasts. For structural data, we can then test differences in gray matter density or in the shape of subcortical structures. And for fMRI, each group level contrast is tested for each of the single subject level contrast that we set up at the earlier step. Finally, we can do our statistical inference. And again, in a similar way for different modalities. Here are some keywords to keep in mind. We have seen the difference between fixed effects and mixed effects where fixed effects is just an average, and we use it, for example, to combine multiple sessions within subject, while in a mixed effects analysis, we also take into account the variability across subjects. So this is the analysis you need to do if you want to make statements about the population as a whole. Among mixed effects models, we have looked at OLS, which is quick, and this is why you run this option in the practical, but it doesn't use the information included in the barcode images, which means that it will take into account the variance across subjects, but not the variance within subject. We recommend instead to use Flame, which uses both the COP and barcode images, and so it will take into account both within and between subject variance. And then we have the non-parametric option, which is randomized. We talked about the problem of multiple comparison corrections and the different types that we have, family-wise error, false discovery rate, and that we have uh, a voxel-based or a cluster-based correction. So here it is, everything nicely reorganized according to the generic blueprint. So hopefully you can refer to this map during your analysis and ask yourself where you are in the pipeline. Are you removing noise? Are you extracting a single subject measure? Are you ready to compare measures across groups, etc.? And we won't stress this enough. Uh, regardless where you are in the pipeline, look at your data and check carefully your results. Now, it's time to briefly move forward and see what's next in the course. We have two more big topics to cover resting state fMRI and diffusion MRI. What I'm going to do now is to quickly go back to the generic blueprint and again highlight some key points that will change and some others that will stay the same for these modalities so that when they will be covered in the specific sessions, you will have an idea of where they fit in the big picture. So don't worry too much if some terms of or concepts won't make sense to you now Hopefully they will by the end of the course. For resting state analysis, the acquisition is still an EPI, like for task fMRI. One thing to consider is the use of multiband, an acceleration technique that acquires multiple slices at the same time. And the advantage of it is that we can shorten the TR, improve the temporal resolution, which allows to get more accurate estimates of functional connectivity. At the data pre-processing level, we still have all the steps that we used for task fMRI with some extra noise reduction. This is because we don't have an a priori hypothesis of what the subject is doing in the scanner, and so noise can influence and potentially drive the results. So we need to apply some additional cleaning and we will see how to do this with ICA. The single subject analysis is going to change. So we don't have a first level GLM anymore because there is no task to model. What we will use instead is a mix of single subject and group level analysis. We will see how to run group level ICA, dual regression and network analysis with FSL nets. For diffusion, the data acquisition is also an EPI sequence, but this time the different volumes we acquire are used to probe diffusion in different directions. Since distortions are a particular problem in diffusion, something to consider at the acquisition stage is the use of blip up, blip down or reversed phase encoding acquisition, which is going to be explained in more detail in the lecture. 
Another technique to consider is multi-shell acquisition. So acquiring data with multiple B values to increase the angular resolution, so to differentiate between more diffusion directions. At the pre-processing level, again, many steps will be common uh, or similar to other EPI data, but we will have an additional source of noise, which is a decurrence. So we will have a specific processing step to correct for them. Regarding single subject analysis, we will see how to derive fractional anisotropy, mean diffusivity, and, to perform, and how to perform tractography. While group level analysis and inference steps will remain the same to what we have seen so far. It will only change the input to them. I hope this recap video and brief overview of what is coming next is useful to you. Enjoy the rest of the course.